What up vlog? Um, this is a keynote I gave in Oslo a couple weeks ago. Super excited about it. Uh, really felt strong. Uh, thought a lot of uh, insights that I haven't uh, touched on in the past were extracted. Uh, the tremendous Oslo. Oslo, stand up. Uh, incredible crowd in Oslo. Uh, extracted uh, some interesting insights and I hope you enjoy it. Real state of the union where my mind is at when it comes to attention and framework and strategy around how to succeed. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Okay. Will everybody stand up? Let's put some energy in the room and let's give a big applause for Gary Vaynerchuk. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Oslo. Um, I, love you. I love you back, bro. It's always good when you bring your brother to a talk. So, you know, I love this format. I really appreciate this format. The give a talk, then we'll do some Q&A together, then we'll bring you guys in. And so what I want to accomplish in part one here is to create a framework of some of the things that may inspire some questions in detail when we get to that part. I think what excites me more than anything as I sit here this morning is that we are living through such an interesting time. One that I think is quite binary. I'm curious what's going through uh, people's minds. As a matter of fact, real quick, because I, I asked some questions, did a little homework. How many people here are in the B2B business? Raise your hands. So this is exciting for me because that's quite a bit and it was interesting what I was thinking about on my flight last night. I, I, I think that there's a lot of misconceptions, assumptions, curiosities, uh, difficulties for a lot of B2B marketers, for a lot of entrepreneurs, for a lot of consumer-based companies. I think it's a very binary debate. I really think that we're in a place right now where you either believe in what I think is happening or you don't. And I think, I want everybody to listen to that sentence very carefully, not about what's coming, not what's about to happen, what's happening versus believing that or not. And so what I mean by that is, I believe a lot of the things that are happening on the mobile device and most importantly, the attention of the end consumer is not debatable. And I think that a lot of people continue to conjure up statements like, yes Gary, in a couple of years, or soon, or it's coming, or we can feel it. All these things that allude to its non-reality. And to be very frank, I'm not frustrated or disappointed. To be very frank, I don't give a shit what you do. I really don't. You know, to me, I'd love to inspire. You know, when I, when I give a talk like this and I see all these faces, my really big hope is that one person sees something in the words that are said today that makes them take this more serious, mainly to be very honest with you, from a selfish place that I want you to email me in three years and say in 2017, you were in Oslo, you said this about B2B marketing on LinkedIn, I finally listened and this happened. I live a life where I get hundreds of emails a day from entrepreneurs, B2B companies, corporations. I had a guy fly into a wine tasting I did for my family business last week. His company went from 300,000 to 60 million in sales in 18 months on the back of Facebook ads and Instagram influencers. I wish on all of you the feeling it feels like when you actually do something nice for another human being when you ask for nothing in return and you can build, to your point, that legacy. My friends, I have no vested interest in this technology revolution. I was super happy pre-internet. I'm old, right? I turned 42 in a couple weeks. I lived pre-internet. I am not a technologist. I didn't own a computer until I was 18 years old. I don't give a shit about gadgets. I don't like VR. I don't like AR. I don't like Facebook. I only like one thing, attention. And so obviously it manifests as a human being and I like this feeling and I'm more comfortable right now doing this than even in any other environment. But more importantly, I like attention much more on a macro. Where do our customers spend their time and how do we create in those environments to create the thing that we want? I 
started VaynerMedia seven years ago, not with the intent to build an agency and sell it to a holding company. I built it because I want to build a communications death star so that I can point it with any ambition I have, whether that's to sell a sneaker, whether that's to raise money for my brother's Crohn's disease, whether that's to help a friend become the mayor of New York in 20 years, whether that's to sell a t-shirt, a bottle of wine, it's agnostic. It's agnostic. Ultimately, it's going to be to use it for propaganda to make everybody in America a New York Jets American football fan. But for the time being, I continue to hone these skills. I sit here today believing in Alexa skills and Amazon's big push for Alexa and Google Home and the future Apple HomePod. I believe in that space not because it's showing ROI today, but my intuition on consumer behavior tells me in 36 months, and 48 months, every single person here is going to interact with an AI-based speaker or device and do search queries and buy products and interact in that environment. We are living through, my friends, let's take a step back. We are living through the biggest shift in the way humans interact with each other since the printing press. This internet thing is a big deal. This is not about Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat. This is about the internet is finally at true scale and we're starting to really understand its impact and it's having obviously geopolitical impacts and I just feel that the audacity amongst the B2B environment and GE is a client and we do things with SAP and I'm a startup investor in tons of SaaS businesses and B2B business, I think there's a gross misunderstanding on how much commerce and actual business results happen in the new environments in a B2B world and let me explain. The trick for the B2B players in this room is that they have to understand the cadence on how they have to communicate in this new environment that completely differentiates from the way that you would communicate as a consumer product. For example, the way I think about the haves and the have nots, the binary people that believe or don't believe right now in this environment plays out in a different way. I call it headline readers versus practitioners. There's a lot of people here who've read an article or two who've talked to some people over dinner and have enormous opinions on what Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or blogging or a podcast can do for their business, yet they've never executed a single podcast, never ran a single Facebook ad, and have never tried segmentation, creative, and media executions in a LinkedIn environment. The reason I keep a Gary V brand, besides the fact that I love attention, is because I need to be a practitioner. In the green room before I came out here, I literally posted on Instagram and thoughtfully thought about the hashtags that I was gonna use to make sure that people discovered it. I pondered the copy that was going to support the video that I was putting out. I watched the video three times to catch the energy that I thought. I thought about the time it was in New York City this morning and that LA would not see it because it was gonna be too early and more of my European fans would. The depth of thoughtfulness on timing and creative and cadence that I thought about a single Instagram post is completely poo-pooed by the modern B2B environment. It is not thought about at any kind of strategic level and the reason that most people fail in winning in social media is because of a couple of huge misconceptions. Number one, there is no social media. Social media is a slang term that we came up with for the websites and apps now that dominate the end consumer's attention in our society. If you're willing to look at social media the word the way I am, which is the apps that live on the cell phone that have most of the attention of the human race and is the current state of the actual internet, all of a sudden, social media doesn't feel so small or a sprinkle or a nice to have or the thing that is coming. Number two, I just don't think people think it's a craft or a strategy or an art to the way that I do. It is far, as somebody who has run television, run print, 
built his family's liquor store business on the back of email and Google. As somebody who's lived in marketing every day for the last 20 years, there's been nothing more complicated or difficult to be successful in than social because especially in a Facebook and LinkedIn environment where the action for this room is, it is the birth child of television and direct mail and Google all in one platform. Most people in the world of business today have not quantified the difference between marketing and branding and sales. Most people either sit on the side of math and are quant-based marketers or sit on the side of art and are creative subjective marketers and they don't realize that the mix of the two and the discipline to respect the tension of both sides in today's environment is the brilliance and need to be successful. And so as somebody who has been a practitioner and attacking that skill set, not only for myself, but for the biggest brands in the world, on the back of an 800 person agency that does all quant and qual work, I have a very unique perspective and I'm very intrigued by it. I'm very intrigued by how many people think it is better to spend money on a print ad in a B2B magazine than it is to run Facebook ads. I'm intrigued by so many people here that are so much quicker to spend for the eighth year in a row 25,000 euros to sponsor a fucking conference <laughs> instead of running $25,000 of LinkedIn ads against the employees of companies that they're trying to reach with creative that would actually make them intrigued or inspired to do business with you, I am super intrigued by the fact, how many people here in the, it, own their own business? Raise their hands. And how many do not? Fantastic. I'm intrigued by the difference of those two groups. I live in a world right now which is broken up between Silicon Valley, Madison Avenue, entrepreneurs and corporates. I like them all very much. I love all people and I especially love all business people. But it is not the second group of hands fault, the employees. It is impossible, you're a human being, it is impossible for you to spend the money of the company as if it was your own. It's just not humanly possible. It's just not the way we're wired. And I watch every day two very distinct things happening in the market today. Entrepreneurs, or people that own their own business, every day moving ungodly amounts of money into influencers, into Facebook, into LinkedIn, and not into, and be careful here, I am not a traditional versus digital debater. For example, I believe that most of the money spent today on digital is going directly in the garbage because most of the money in digital today is spent on programmatic banner and pre-rolls on websites that nobody's paying attention to and there's no context for the creative. It's just hitting the CPM value or the impression value. It has nothing to do with driving the business results. So this is not a traditional media is dead, digital is here. I have more issues with most digital. It's about today. It's about day trading attention. It is you are trying to sell jet engines or shipping supplies or a SaaS business and you have $10,000 to make that happen, what are you gonna do with it? And to me, that's when you need to understand the day trading of attention. What's underpriced and overpriced attention? If you're in America and you wanna sell product to an under 30 year old kid, a pair of sneakers, Snapchat should have 50% of your money regardless of how good of a deal Snapchat stock is because that's the end consumer's attention. And so we're living through a time where the biggest businesses in the world are vulnerable because distribution of information and products have been commoditized by the internet. The distribution of our attention or the information to us has been commoditized. Nobody here was shooting a satellite into space to start a TV network 20 years ago at, with that capital infrastructure and the cameras and the studios, but literally every one of you in your pocket right now has live television, literally, for free on Facebook Live or Instagram Live. I mean, it is remarkable. We have completely taken for granted, completely taken for granted the power that we sit on 
in our hands right now. The recording that you're doing right now used to cost tens of thousands of dollars in equipment literally just 30 years ago. We are completely misunderstanding where the attention is. We are misunderstanding the single biggest opportunity for every B2B company here, and that is to act like a media company, not an advertiser. The biggest problem for all the B2B companies here is is that it's hard to advertise B2B products. And so what happens when it's hard? It becomes very vanilla. You show three people smiling in a fucking office, right? (laughs) And you put it on a piece of paper on page 87 and you think something good's gonna happen in 20 fucking 18. (laughs) This is what happens. I mean, we know it. Or you make a flyer and you send it in the mail and you think that's a good idea in 2018. How many people here can't wait to leave this conference and go home and carefully go through their direct mail? (laughs) Yeah. So, So what happens is we have no cadence or understanding or creative output, yet everybody here can take those same dollars and do a six part mini series in audio form and create a six part documentary in podcast form around the behaviors in their industry or creative that's interesting to their users. For example, I have a lawyer friend who's starting a golf podcast because he's trying to reach high net worth individuals and a lot of them play golf. He's not starting a lawyer podcast because nobody wants to listen to that. (laughs) He's starting an interest podcast as a gateway drug to his services because the law firm is bringing you the golf information. And so, if I can leave with anything, if anything, if I can get one of the hands that went up from the B2B environment in this room, if I can get one of them to actually make the shift that in 2018, instead of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on print and sponsorship and direct mail as an advertiser, we're going to look at the digital landscape and become a media company and bring value and interest to our prospective clients as a gateway drug, that would be a huge accomplishment to make it a little less altruistic and lofty and confusing, even if you just started writing white papers that were not sales release, but were actually white papers. If you get out of sales and you get into branding, if you make a white paper about trends in your industry and why you're servicing them, right? If you made a white paper that was 13 pages, thoughtful, smart, you put energy behind it, your best people behind it, and you ran that on LinkedIn and Facebook against the employees, and this is how you segment in an ad form, against the employees of the companies that you aspire to do business with, you would see remarkable results because what attention is most interesting to me, how many people here have ever played in the real estate industry in their careers. Raise your hands, just curious. This is interesting to me. I've started realizing, huh, I'm acting and navigating this world like I'm in the real estate business. Your attention is no different than real estate people look at new places, new beachfront properties, emerging cities, trends within cities that make you think the property is underpriced, All I do for a living every day is what's underpriced and what's overpriced. And market by market. What's happening in Oslo that isn't happening in New York? Or what's happening in New York? And one of the great, I mean unbelievable advantages of being in a market that is not the United States of America is being able to watch the trends and understanding which ones will transfer and not. Not every app will pop in the Nordics that pop in America. However, 90% of all of this that I'm talking about is human not cultural. These are human dynamics. Let me give you one. Everybody here will give up privacy for time. Time is the pillar asset for us besides health, money, and religion. Time. So, when I think about audio and why I push you to thinking about a podcast, is because if you're trying to reach a high net worth individual or a decision maker in a business that would do business with you in a B2B environment, I'm gonna make the assumption that I think we all can, is that she's busy. And what audio does, how many people here follow my content? Raise your hands. Thank you. Of the people that just, keep your hands up, I want the other people to see this. Thank you. Look around if you're in the front. 
Okay, not, not, no, it's not enough, don't worry. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is watch now this. Okay, thank you. Now, of those people, how many of you in the last year have started listening more to my podcast and watching less of my video? Raise your hands. That. That's what I am most intrigued by right now. To me, thank you. To me, the fact that technology in 2018 and 19 is moving us as humans to act more like people from the 1930s to 60s and consume more radio because we have it on us because we are subconsciously trying to find more time because time is emerging as an asset because we're getting pounded with information because we are starting to get trained, we grossly underestimate the brain and human beings. We're starting to get trained to listen to the podcast and do something else. And so I am betting on voice, both podcast and Alexa skills and Google Home and all those skills because I know that is the thing we're gonna buy into. One of my great misses in my investment career, Uber, which I passed on twice in the angel round at a $4 million valuation, I invested in later at a $100 million valuation because I realized Uber wasn't selling transportation, Uber was selling the perception of time. When you hit that button, you're able to go on and do what you're doing until it gets there. And that was the remarkable insight. So much of what you do every day the things you value. Do you know why you don't unsubscribe from emails that you have no interest in getting? Time. It takes you longer to unsubscribe to the email than it does to just delete it or swipe it out. Time is driving so much of our behavior and in the B2B environment, in the B2B environment, it is emerging more to me strategically because the decision makers were desperate to reach value time even more. And that's why they will not go through their direct mail. That is why they will not go through a magazine carefully and stumble on your advertisement. Can, can we, Oslo, can we make a deal? Can you not buy a print fucking ad next year? <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm talking and I'm like, then the other part of my brain is like, yeah, this is so ridiculous. Like, how the fuck can you buy a print ad in 2018? It, it makes no sense what it's so, so over, do you know that you pay eight to 12 times circulation as the CPM cost for a print ad in case Jorge leaves the magazine on the bus and Susan picks it up and goes to page 90 fucking seven and sees your ad? <laughs> the lack of practicality is so obnoxious, yet there are people here who comfortably buy print ads because that's what we've always done while asking what the ROI of Facebook and LinkedIn is. Just incredible times and you will see some of the biggest companies in the world over the next decade completely vanish off the face of the earth because of their misallocation and their misunderstanding of where the consumer's attention is. They will not understand. They will go out of business. This is happening. It's happening faster than you think. You see it all around the world. I was in Singapore last week. The number two magazine media company shut down its print. It's happening every single day in America. Toys R Us, the biggest toy retailer, out of business. Out of business. This is happening every single day and will continue to accelerate and I'm stunned that I go to a dinner every night of the week where for the first 30 minutes, a 70-year-old executive will want to talk to me for 30 minutes how he or she cannot believe that Facebook has changed the election in the US, changed the Brexit, it's unbelievable, they should shut it down, we need laws, this is crazy, it's too powerful, it's super scary, what about our grandchildren? And then we will transition to the 30 minutes of the business talk and they'll say to me, but my customers aren't on Facebook. That's what I do every time too. I throw up directly on them. <laughs> it's, it's time, it's time we have the proper conversation, which is the following. Most things that we grew up with five years ago, banner ads and pre-rolls included, are overpriced. It's not that anything's dead. I hate when people are like, TV's dead. TV's not dead. You know, radio's not dead, they're overpriced. What you pay for is not what you get. Meanwhile, everybody in here will read an article in six years that says 2000, 
2012 to 2019 was a golden era of Facebook ads and you should have done more. And now that they're $48 CPM instead of $7 CPM, you'll regret it and you'll be sad, right? That's what happened to me. When I get introduced and people say, he built his dad's liquor store from three to $60 million and everybody's like, ah, I get sad because I spent too much money on print and outdoor and radio and all the other things even though it was staring me in the face that Google for five and 10 and 11 cents a click was driving unbelievable ROI. I took it for granted. I was too young and didn't understand how good of a deal it was. And that's why I stand passionately up here today and tell you every penny you can afford to put into Facebook and create videos and pictures to make it work every penny you can afford for the B2B players to put into LinkedIn and create white papers and videos for them, every penny you can afford because you will go back and look at this era much like many of you did with Google in the early 2000s and then you did it in 2010 and 12 and 15 and you're like, and you caught up. The problem was now you're paying the appropriate price. You're not stealing it like everybody did from 2001 to 2006. That is what's happening. Either I'm right or I'm wrong, it will play itself out, but I will tell you this. When I see, how many of you are familiar with Wish, the shopping app? Raise your hands. Wow, that in itself, 18 months ago if I asked that question, four hands would have put up. One more time, how many of you are familiar with Wish? How many of you bought in something off Wish? Fuck, this all makes sense. Listen to this, (laughs) Wish in the last seven years or six years has gone from zero zero to anywhere between three to five billion dollars in sales. It is probably the most emerging, most important retailer in the world that most people don't know, yet it is a top 50 app in every single app store country on Apple in the world. All of their money, all of their money until this last year where they put some branding on the Lakers jerseys and on the Mayweather McGregor fight in the corner, all of their money for the last six years has been spent on Facebook. And these were engineers that were employees from Google and left. Why? Because they saw the pattern recognition that I saw, which was Amazon. Amazon was Google's biggest advertiser in the early days of Google, and they used that underpriced attention to build a monster company. And that's exactly what these Wish founders did. They knew that Google was underpriced for those years. They knew that Facebook was the new underpriced model. They went all in, all in, and they bought underpriced attention, acquired customers at an underpriced nature, and built against that momentum. That environment is still available for the next 24 months for the majority of this room, including the people that are practitioners and understand that you can target employees of organizations on Facebook and I highly recommend that you do not take this talk for granted and you go back home after today and you start Googling how do I run Facebook ads for my B2B SaaS business? How do I do this? How do I do that? The tactics are commoditized. You can Google it at home. The mindset to understand what year we're actually living in is the punchline of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, Gary. Awesome. My friend Rick bought me this. I like this. Yeah, it's a jet set. I like um, the jets. And I realized that it doesn't really make any sense to give it to you. Okay. Because you probably I have, have thousands. Seven thousand of them. Yeah, yes. But, but I still have it. So. Um, Should we give, sign it and give it to somebody else? That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. We'll uh, we'll do that. Okay. We, okay. Cool. So sit down here, please. Sure. Some water, Red Bull. We're gonna have a lot of fun with these, by the way. Uh, it, you heard about this? Catchbox? Of course. I fucking speak every day. You're so trendy. Fuck. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Um, okay. So, um, we are going to have a little conversation and then you guys can already start thinking about all the cool questions you're going to ask. Uh, but I just want to start. Please. Um, so, first of all, welcome back to Oslo. Thank you. How are you feeling? Great. Yeah? Great. Thank you so much, guys, for the energy. Really appreciated it. So the room is filled with, with business people. Yep. Um, and as we talked about before you hit the stage, um, Norway is quite ahead in terms of, of digital. Um, 100%. Snapchat is bigger than Instagram here. Um, and, 
and I would say the average Norwegian uses social a lot. I agree. But still, um, I get the vibe from the, the advertising industry that yes. a lot of businesses are still very behind on, um, on investing in Facebook ads, Google AdWords, all that jazz, as yes. you were just describing over 70-year-old din uh, dinner meetings with 70-year-old people. And you know why that is, right? Tell me. It's not a Norwegian thing. It's not a Nordic thing. It's a global thing. It's because the biggest holding companies that are the four to five biggest holding companies in the advertising industry, the WPPs, the Omnicoms, the Publicis, these are publicly traded companies who should be driving their business results, not their clients' results, are always selling things that they make the most margin on, which is television and programmatic digital, and then they will support it with bullshit reports that are an inside the game dynamic to justify the spend, and they are extracting the value out of the biggest companies in the world. And so they feel comfortable with the reports and the bullshit fucking metrics that they measure on internal MMMs. And so it's a complete inside, have you, did you see The Big Short, the movie The Big yeah, Short? Yeah, yeah. That's what's happening in the advertising world. Everybody's in on it. The companies are fucking getting fucked. They're gonna lose. The biggest media companies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more profitable. Uh, and uh, that's why it's happening. So basically, they should fire their agencies then? Um, no, I don't think it's their agency's fault. I think it's their fault. Right. They, agencies aren't stealing their money. They're giving the agencies the money. That's true, so. I think what should happen is we should start changing the way we compensate the C-suite of the biggest companies in the world because all of them are making decisions based on what the stock price is when they leave so they can liquidate and buy their yacht, not if Red Bull's gonna be around for 30 years. Damn. <laughs> and you know what's funny? Yeah? They all know it. Right. I was watching, you guys all know it. I know I'm, I, I mean, I know I'm right, and you know I'm right. Now, that doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean it's gonna change. It just means there's an opportunity, right? When, when companies that have a lot more money than you are throwing 95% of their money directly in the garbage, you have a chance of winning. Wine.com had $114 million in fundraising when I had $14,000 in advertising in 1997. I beat them. Why? Because I did the right thing for the business not because I was an executive trying to maximize my personal wealth. Right. Do you then think that like, entrepreneurs and small businesses have a bigger chance to win now than ever? A hundred percent. Yeah. That, it's happening. This is not me predicting. The fuck do you think has happened in the last 10 years? This is the greatest era because, because money, if you're comp let's say you want to start a toothpaste brand. You're passionate about toothpaste. You want to make more all-natural toothpaste and you want to sell it. You can now sell that direct to consumer at scale at a level we've never seen before. But if you wanted to start that 25 years ago, the amount of money you had to pay Tesco or Sainsbury or Walmart just for trade dollars, distribution, driving, like, of course. And then if you actually run Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook influencer ads instead of billboards or print or direct mail, I mean, absolutely. This is an incredible time to act like an entrepreneur, whether you're an entrepreneur or a corporation. Right. And when I say act like an entrepreneur, you're scared. You know, the reason I became a great marketer was because the marketing was for my dad's liquor store and that's how my family ate. I wasn't going for Can Lion Awards. I wasn't looking at reports every 90 days that were metrics on the brand health lift. This was about fucking selling Pinot Noir. And, uh, and so I got very disciplined that marketing had to do something for you, not make you feel good about justifying that you're a CMO. Right, and I, I saw you visited um, Ken Lines this year, um, just like other other big agencies. So the things you're, you're preaching and you're communicating to us today, um, how, I mean, acting like all the others going to Ken having meetings, having parties, all that kind of things. How do, how do you make sure that your whole company are kind of communicating the same things you are doing and making them understand how to prioritize or the client's budgets in a different way? Dictatorship. <laughs> Sounds like fun. 
it is fun. I mean, especially when, when you're pushing good. Yeah. You know, it's super fun. If, if, I, if I see tendencies from a leader, Eric here, who's sitting in the front, who runs our you know, UK office and most of our European activities, if, if I get any indication that Eric is pushing something that is in the short-term value of VaynerMedia because he wants the P&L of the London office to look better and he knows that the client will buy this but it's not on message, he won't have a job and he knows that. And it's not, that's not bad, that's just to make sure we don't lose. Like, to me, I'm not scared to go to conferences and have a party. Like, to me, that's a framework. What comes, at, that's, like, you know, that's like being a human being, we're all the same. It's about what's coming out of our mouths and what our actions are. You know, I am met with a lot of cynicism. It, you said it, you expect, watch it, you'll love this. How many people here when they first saw me um, or consume my content thought I was a douchebag or completely full of shit? Raise your hands. Right. So like, I'm aware of that, and the good news is that doesn't cripple me because either I can deliver or I can't. Either you're right or I'm right. And that's kind of how I feel about Boehner, right? Like I'm not worried about going to Cannes because I go to Cannes and have this conversation. Yeah. You know, the, the qual- you know, so like, you know, having sizzle or looking like everybody else in the front is irrelevant. It's the execution on the back end that is going to ultimately be the case, right? Yeah, absolutely. When, when you and I took that picture years ago, I was amongst other social media experts that were charlatans that were gonna take opportunity in this short window. I laughed because I was already a 33-year-old businessman who'd already built an actual business. I wasn't a real estate agent six months earlier, right? I just truly believed that the attention of all these people was going to be in these things. I, you know, there's videos of me you know, in 2013, a hell of a lot chubbier, saying like Snapchat's gonna happen. Either I'm right or I'm wrong. This is not, you know, super complicated. I said here, it's on video, that voice is gonna matter and all of you are gonna interact with speakers in four years. And if you don't, people are gonna pull up those videos and say, don't listen to Gary, look how wrong he's been. So I don't predict, I don't, you know, I, every time there's a new app, I don't, I don't do what a lot of other people do and just say this is gonna be big and hope one of them is. I don't fucking guess, I don't hope, I fucking work and I execute. True, I like that. <laughs> um, when we tweeted out that you're going to visit us today, I got a lot of questions about Vayner Media in Europe and yes. in the Nordics. Can you maybe share a little bit about your plans there? Look, I, uh, we have ambition to service the globe in a 40-year macro. And so, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people in Nordics saw what we did with Arctic Startup and, and you know, we have, we have 10 teammates coming to Helsinki in January. Like, we're looking at this part of the world very feverishly. Uh, I'm a very big fan of the time I've spent in the Nordics. And I'll be, you know, look, I think a lot of you do watch my content. I don't go to every place and be like, I like you. I do like this. I, I, there's a really, in, you know, it's interesting, right? So I'm funny with Europe because I disrespect it. Because even though I was born in Belarus and born in Eastern Europe, like, there's, like, I'm a, I'm a work ethic guy. And I'm very empathetic to, like, work-life balance and quality of life. I'm, I don't judge anybody's opinion, but, like, to, in business, I do think work ethic is super hardcore important and I think certain parts of the world have it too extreme and work too hard and I think a lot, I think New York is one of them, I really do. Even though I work harder than them, I can take back a step subjectively and go, that's a lot, right? And then there's other parts of the world that don't work at all, like Greece and shit, right? Like the, you know, and, and I'm like, you're fucking losers, right? And so, but it's been interesting and I've been to, the Nordics maybe 12, 13 times. I think there's an interesting cadence here. I think there's interesting brands here. I think there's interesting businesses here and uh, we have real ambitions. Um, obviously, for people that follow me the most, they saw that I kind of ran my mouth and said, we'll be in Singapore in 2018 uh, with VaynerMedia, which I would say is 95% accurate. And so we're looking at Southeast Asia very aggressively right now. Um, but over the next 20 years, the Vayner brand will have a flag in every, Every sector, right? Every, you know, South America and Africa, we will be everywhere. And so, um, we will be here. Cool. Timing, I don't know. Cool. Um, so, I started referring to the jab-jab method when I work with my clients. Focus on giving value, earning the right to market. 
Um, is that a, still a very important thing to focus on, in your opinion? And what are the big lines of advice you usually give to your clients, like high level? For a lot of people that don't know, I wrote a book several years ago called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Give, 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 and then ask. Um, I think a lot of people, when they put out content, are ask, 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 or take, 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 right? I think what has really worked for me and the clients that I've worked with and the startups that I've worked with is when you actually give value. And a lot of times people think they're giving value, but if you look carefully, it's selfish, right? So these are nuances. But yeah, I think, I think it's never been more important to be what I would call consumer-centric. A lot of people here talk in boardrooms about being consumer-centric, but advertising in general already is not consumer-centric. You wanna steal my time to tell me how good your soda is. That's not inherently consumer-centric. And so, more than ever, I believe in empathy. I think empathy is the secret drug of success in our society, both as a leader, when you're a boss, and definitely when you think about the consumer. And I think that the trait of empathy that I took from my mother is no question, maybe outside of competitiveness that I took from my dad, the core reason why I sit here today. And uh, if anything, I would tell you if I wrote it again, I would call it jab, 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 right hook. <laughs> it's just more important because there's so much being thrown out, right? As the supply of content and noise grows, you have to differentiate with more value, not less. And so, again, trying to speak to the people here who've been following me, you've, you've seen in the last 18 months compared to the prior five years, I've been more aggressive of putting out free information and good content and in written, in audio, in video, in multiple shows. Like I'm going harder to bring value because I felt like it was the only way that I could separate and create the opportunities that I wanted for myself was basically, I basically think I'm trying to guilt people into being interested in what I'm doing by providing so much more value with nothing in return that it almost creates a level of guilt. Yeah, I see that. Um, I've noticed that you switched from, you've been, you're a lot more motivational in your content now than I agree. you were earlier. I agree. And I remember that you said in an interview once that you were very afraid of being looked at Desperately as a motivational fearful. speaker. Yes. So Why'd I what, do it? what changed? I built a, another $150 million revenue a year business and it made me feel good that if you called me a motivational speaker, I would say, that's fine, but have you been paying attention to the fact that I grew the fastest growing agency in the industry in parallel? So by building, an actual business, and by actually being a CEO, and by actually, again, not just Wine Library, but now again a second time, building something, you know, listen, it's not easy to build something from zero dollars and zero cents to $150 million in revenue, not valuation, in a seven year window. That takes operational skill. And so if you don't see that that's what I've done, well then that's okay. But what has allowed me to be more motivational is the lack of fear that that was the only thing I was doing. I am optimistic. So you got more confidence than proof. A hundred percent. I felt like I had, you know, and don't forget how I figured out the D-Rock thing, right? Yeah. He's just filming me. I'm living my life. It's not like I'm doing that. I'm not, Gary Vee is my side hustle. True. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk, CEO of a large enterprise, is what I do. And so, yes, I felt more comfortable, confident that I could speak a little bit to the motivation. Because the truth is, it's really scary. It's, you know, it's the way I gave this talk. The tactics are very commoditized. It's the mindset which gets into motivational aspects that is so imperative because you're trying to break through insecurities in individuals that lack the courage to do something and are crippled by fear because they're worried about other people's opinions, I'm trying to push so hard to, I'm basically trying to be their courage so they can blame me if they fail, which I'm fine with, I just want them to do. Yeah, and you think it's easy for people to, to do things they're scared of if they can blame you at the end if it didn't work? 100%, I, I really mean that. Yeah. Like I, I, and I'm, I'm okay with that because I think that if, I think that people don't understand how much they're gonna regret when they're older. Hmm. I also think a lot of executives here are gonna get fired in six years for being conservative, even though that's what their company's telling them to do. They're gonna be the fall guy and the fall gal when the company starts faltering 
just like the CMO of Under Armour was just pushed out yesterday. I met with him, he was very conservative. The company was telling him to be conservative, but when it hurt Under Armour, he's the one that's getting killed, not the CEO. So a bunch of people here are gonna be out of a job, they think they're being smart and a political animal and they're gonna get promoted. What they don't realize is that the market's changing on them and when everybody looks at them and they were the ones pushing bullshit because the company wanted them to pull bullshit, they're gonna get fired and I don't want that to happen to them so I'm trying to get them to die on their sword instead of somebody else's and I'm trying to focus on getting them to tell the truth instead of what they think they need to do to get another bonus this year. Cool. Thank you. And the reason they're clapping is they know how true what I just said was. Yes. And you're clapping yet conflicted. And I'm empathetic. I don't think I'm cool. I don't think you're bad. I just want to have these conversations so you can be thoughtful. Right? Like maybe it's time to have the courage to say what you actually believe because let me tell you something. Getting killed on somebody else's thesis sucks. You'd rather go down with yours. Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It's it's the big one. Yeah. It's the big one. Yeah. It's the one that, again, that's why the reaction happened. If I can just give people courage to go into a meeting tomorrow and go, you know what? First of all, they may not have the skill set of understanding Facebook or Snapchat filters or whatever it may be. First, you gotta motivate them to go home and read and watch and get educated, right? But if they're here at all, they're already ahead of 99%. If they even are here, I've already got, you know, when I speak, I'm not speaking in the middle of Red Square hoping I can convince a couple Russians, right? I'm in conferences where people have already come, you're already on third base. Now it's just which way are you gonna go? Are you gonna go back or is this the moment you're gonna go forward? And I take a huge, res- I'm flattered that I was invited here. I feel obligated to give my best thoughts and efforts here. And so that's why I speak and communicate the way I do. I'm playing for legacy. I like that. Um, so I noticed a kind of a pattern interrupt in, in what you've been doing with, with Planet of the Apps. So um, for those of you guys who don't know, it's, it's a show on Apple Music. Um, and I would just love your, because it's more traditional media, kind of. So I'd love to just hear your thoughts on... Why I did it? Uh, why I did it, and if uh, you got what you wanted out of it. Um, I got what I wanted out of it. Not all of what I wanted out of it, but I did it because I love doing things that are win-win, no matter what happens. It's why I did the sneaker. Yeah, I was going through the And I'll explain as well, that yeah. as well, but I'll stay to your question. The reason I did that is because the other three people that were my guests, that were my, my mentors, are fucking famous as shit, you know? And, uh, and by being the fourth, you know, by being Ringo, but knowing that I was John or Paul <laughs> was a very good strategy, right? I, I knew it was a subject matter that I had much more expertise at, right? I knew that I was gonna be good on camera because I am good on camera, just I'd never done a television show. And I thought the whole time that Apple would never release it on Apple Music because I thought that was awkward. Why would you watch a show on Apple Music? We didn't get, you know, I don't like to fight the consumer as I was saying in the green room. You do what the consumer does. So the whole time, you know, it took a year after we signed to coming out, the whole time I'm like, okay, they're gonna create something called Apple. They're gonna do something with Apple TV or they're gonna create Apple Entertainment or they're gonna buy Netflix. Like the whole time I thought there's no, literally to like the week before the show aired, I'm like, there's no way they're gonna distribute this on Apple Music. So the reason I didn't get everything is because it was on Apple Music and that was awkward, they didn't watch even though it was in every country in the world. What I did get was in 10 episodes for Hollywood, I put on film that I'm a celebrity, I'm a star, and I'm worth doing business with and the level of business deals that I've been offered to do any business show I want on the biggest networks in the world has been remarkable. Now, ironically, I am so excited about what's going on with VaynerX. You know, I bought PureWow, I created a holding company, VaynerMedia, and I think the stakes are so high based on what I've been talking about with the opportunity, what the holding companies are doing, that I'm, 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 I was about to say I'm probably, I'm not gonna do a TV show next year like I thought I would, mm-hmm. uh, even though the offers are better than I could have even imagined because I have to stay disciplined and be the operator because the opportunity is too great and so I'm gonna see that through. But 
It was great and also I love doing firsts. Apple is going to figure out original programming and one day I'll be sitting at, bro. (laughs) I get it, respect. Um, (laughs) Tough crowd, huh? Yeah, he better be taking a shit. Um, uh, I know, I know, which is even better. I wish everybody fucking left right now and went to work. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I, I like that I'll be able to be here in seven years at this conference. We'll be talking about how all the networks died in OTT1, and I'll be able to make a reference like, yeah, you know, when I did the first show on Apple, right. that has value, and that's how I think. So it was all upside, all upside. By traditional TV, if I did a regular TV show like I was offered a ton, and it failed, for ratings, in theory, the way this did, yep. then I'd have nothing. Here, I siphoned the brand equity and had, and I'm completely on a different pedestal in Hollywood because I'm with the other famous people. I, it was a show that was around my strengths, so I was disproportionately better on it. Yeah. Um, so it was a win-win. I, I, it's very smart to do business things where there is no downside. <laughs> <laughs> So, so two seconds about your shoes before my last question, before yes. we open up. Um, Literally so, the same exact thing. Yeah? Sure. It's the fir- it, you know, out of a top 10 sneaker brand, it's the first collaboration where an entrepreneur has a shoe, not an athlete or a musician. If it works, then I get to always say that I had the first business sneaker, right? Right? If it doesn't work, my best friends get to make fun of me for having a big ego. So last question before we open up for the audience. So you talk a lot about legacy. Yes. And you're talking about legacy being greater than currency. I do. Uh, What do you mean by that? I'd rather be remembered as a tremendous human being than make a couple extra dollars. I leave money on the table every day. Way more than people would realize. Like my assistants, my admins, my lawyers, my agents, they're always freaked out because I make decisions that are gonna look good when I'm dead versus making an extra $7 million a year this year. And so, I make, when I made $100,000 a year, I'd made it. You know, I came from nothing. You know, when you're an immigrant and you live in a studio apartment with seven family members and you got nothing, when your parents buy you seven toys your entire life and you had to buy the rest of them, when you went on one family vacation in your entire childhood, like, you're coming from a different place. So, uh, you know, like I said, when I made $100,000 a year for the first time, when Wine Library got bigger, I was like, whew, I made it, you know? So for me, I'm not driven by the money. The money will be there, the money's there now at a level that I am super excited about. I know I wanna buy the Jets, but it's the chase of trying far more than it. And, uh, And I think I was, listen, when I talk about what I think I have that's special, I don't think that's, in ego or confidence, I think that's, that's giving my parents and being an immigrant a pedestal. Yeah. When I talk about being good, I think that's me flattering my parents. What did I do about it? You know, my kids, my businesses, I feel pride in. Me? That's my parents' work. That's America's capitalism at work. That's being an immigrant at work. I have nothing to do with the admiration that I have from people, so it keeps me very grounded. Yeah. The reason I was nice, you know, when people meet me is I didn't do anything. I'm the byproduct of Sasha and Tamara. They should be running around acting big shots. I'm fucking just, you know, trying to deliver on the gifts and I'm driven completely fueled, completely fueled on gratitude. I'm so grateful for my circumstances and that's why I want to give back. I feel guilty. The reason I understand how to guilt is because I feel that guilt for having such an unbelievable mother. I feel that guilt for being born, in, thank you, for being, for being born with talents to communicate that touch people. I feel guilty for struggling, which created a skin that makes all your opinions matter to me and not matter to me at the same time. And so, yeah, I, I really want legacy, to be very honest with you, because I feel like I was built for it. Like I, you know, I, I don't like saying it because it does sound so douchey, mm-hmm. but I think I'll be all time. That, that, <laughs> I love that. And, and, and let me tell you why. Yeah? Because I haven't even started. I'm 41 years old. Like, I have 40, 50 years of work 
to put into the world. And, and for you and others here, you've seen what's happened in one year compared to a year ago. The momentum is so exponential and that's how it works, right? Yeah. It builds and it builds and what I have is real and it's honest and I really genuinely want to give them 51 because I know what to do with the 49% yeah. and I watch everybody else and they want 80 and they want 90 and they want 100 and that's why I'll beat them. I like that. So you said you had that <sighs> I made it moment yeah. many, many years ago. Yep. Um, do you still have those moments? Do you, I mean, are, are you still, I'm I know you're grateful, I'm, but are you still having those kind of a moments? And or? even that one was kind of like whatever. Like, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not good at smelling the roses. No, that was. But yeah. I, to your question, it's an interesting thought and I think it affects people around me. That's why I think about it. For me, playing the game is the roses. The process, the struggle, the failures, is the stuff that gets me going, not the accolades, the awards, the money. I like the game. I liked four sports teams in America growing up. My baseball team and hockey team won a championship and I stopped caring. My football team and my basketball team still haven't and I care quite a bit. That's me. I want the climb. I want the struggle. And I've been successful and I think most people are successful when they are in it for the right reasons. Yeah. And if you're an entrepreneur, the right reasons are getting punched in the face. You get punched in the face every day as an entrepreneur. Everything's on you, it's lonely, it's very difficult. It's been good the last eight years because the world economy's good. Wait till it gets bad again. Mm -hmm. A lot of these kids don't know yet. They don't know what it feels like when the world melts, the money dries up and you still gotta survive. Yep. And I've been through two of those cycles already. And like, I'm looking forward to the next one. I can't wait for the world to melt because all the C and D and B players get eliminated and go get jobs. And I like that, that's merit, that's capitalism, that's the game. And so I, I don't smell the roses when things happen because I think I'm smelling the roses in real time every day. I like that. Ready for some questions? I am. All right, people. Um, can we change the lighting so we can actually see all the people as well? Uh, and Dominic, I'll give it to you, catch. That's fancy. Um, hi, Gary. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Love you. Thank I love you, you very too, much. Thanks for, for the hoodie. Yeah. One Thank life, you. baby. Yes. I see it. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm curious. You talk always about you talk always about speed. Yes. It's important. Very. Hiring is important. Yes. And firing is even more important. How? 100%. What What is the process in Vener Media? How, how long do you does it take for you to fire a person? Somebody's somebody just got approved to be fired in 90 days today. Other okay. people, I've been agonizing for 18 months. Okay. There's no one size fits all, right? There's, there's two forces. There's me as an individual, as the dictator, as the CEO, as the leader, and then there's the collective leadership, right? Yeah. And I try to counterbalance them. I don't blindly, I don't take my leadership's opinions blindly because they're protecting their lives and their opportunity, and so they may be doing the wrong thing subconsciously. They're not bad people. Um, so it runs the gamut. I mean, there was somebody I hired not too long ago that I thought was gonna be important and I basically fired that person in my mind 48 hours later. Okay. So the problem, the reason most people here don't fire when they're supposed to is their own ego. They don't wanna admit that they were wrong in making the selection of the person. And it is killing so many of your businesses. Uh, or the other reason they don't fire is somebody's too important to their business financially, even though they're a cancer internally, which means they're gonna lose long term too. Okay. And so, I don't do those two things. I make sure that I'm way better than everybody that works for me, so I'm never at the mercy of anybody. <laughs> I'm being serious. Uh, uh huh. And, uh, and, uh, and I also am very humble when it comes to my I think I have great EQ, it's what I trade on, but I've been so wrong so many times because it's so difficult. Um, and so um, they run the gamut. There's a million different things. What's okay. unacceptable, what speeds up, people are fired much quicker for being not nice to the other boys and girls, much quicker than not being good at their job. They can't be disruptive to the energy the culture, because I don't like tension and negativity, and if you're fucking me up, you got no shot. 
I like that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, could you sign? Book? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay, okay. so um, Rick, I I'm throw throwing it to you. Nice throw. Damn, I thank you. Good throw. Can you hear me? Uh, we, we, in a second, I think we can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Gary, welcome to Oslo. Thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> I've got two questions. Yes. My first question, first off, I want to say thank you for talking so much about gratitude. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, man. My first question, I'm going to try to make you jealous. Go ahead. All right. I was a 13-year-old boy. I was growing up, I was living in West Islip, New York. Yes. January 12th, 1969. 1969. Best day I got up Earth. at 6 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep. Oh, man, I'm Waiting super for 4 o'clock jealous. in the afternoon, what was I doing? You were ready for the New York Jets. Stunning. My friends, the Sports Illustrated, the most important sports magazine in America at the time, predicted the Jets would lose the Super Bowl 41 to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they were the biggest underdog in Super Bowl history, and they won. Broadway Joe Namath against Johnny Unitas. That's amazing, Nichols. man. That's so cool. So, yes. <laughs> I, I'm moment. actually jealous. I brought you hat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was the hat. You have the, a question? The second question is yeah. about voice, because I'm really voice. happy you're talking about voice. Yeah. I just launched a voice app, which is a voice analysis technology called Voiceable. And what we do with the app is we record somebody's voice, and then we help speakers and presenters to work on their voice. Interesting. And it's inter it is interesting, and it allows you to compare yourself to some of the greatest speakers and inspirational speakers so in the world. So you're breaking down the analytics of exactly. the sounds. Exactly, making it easy to practice with it. Interesting. But the number one celebrity that you can compare yourself with is always Barack Obama. Hard okay. Beat. Most people want to do it. But number two is Gary Vee. <laughs> I think you've got your ratings wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I may have, I may have. <laughs> That's so my, amazing. So my question I've is, gotta see that. there's all these entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs who are racing around and they wanna be like Gary Vee. And they're talking fast and they're trash talking. And you know that scares me, right? That does scare you. And, I, and my comment is, what would you have, what kind of a comment would you have to them, advice I would say to them? for them to be them. Like I think, you know, self-awareness, along with gratitude and along with empathy is something I'm spending a lot of time talking about. It's funny, I come across so alpha, so when I talk about all these soft and warm skills, I'm always fascinated by how people consume it because it's a real curveball, right? Yeah. Um, what I would tell them is they need to deploy self-awareness. What made me me was I was brought up with so much self-esteem by a mother that understood its power and I had my own DNA and circumstances that I didn't want to be anybody else. I, the level of knowledge I have on Richard Branson or Steve Jobs, or Jack Welsh, or Bill Gates, or Mark, I know nothing about anybody. Like, zero. I've always just focused on being confident about what I had, and more importantly, being humble about what I didn't have. You can't, you know, when you try to fabricate charisma, it comes out as the worst shtick ever. Mm, yeah. And we can all taste it, and so, Look, I, I've doubled down and tripled down and quadrupled down and continue to on what I have. Um, and so I try to tell a lot of these young men, you know, it's been really interesting for me. I've been spending an ungodly amount of time m on motivation because I think it's a gateway drug to get a lot of young men into my funnel. And I think a lot of young men are very easily swayed to the wrong things because of insecurities and what kind of things guys want in their 20s. And I've been very proud about this last year from a legacy standpoint of getting so many guys to think I'm cool mm. because then I systematically break them down with my content <laughs> and instead of being disrespectful and instead of looking for money and girls and things of that nature, I start teaching them tried and true things that will make them get everything they've ever wanted and be a much better contributor to society. Great, thank you Gary, thank You're you welcome. very much. Yeah. And let's make sure we bring it up there because I always feel like we always mess sure. that up, you right? Yeah. yeah. This happens. Hey, Gary. Inspiring. How are you? Fine, thank you. Very inspiring to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I have a question. I do sales training for business to business. Awesome. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for them is to find the right customers and actually get enough customer meetings with the right clients. Makes sense. I think that's all over the world <laughs> about the same problem. Do you know why? Uh, because most people in B2B sales are always talking instead of listening. Yeah. 
I totally agree. The concept is spam everybody on fucking LinkedIn, pound them, pound them, pound them, and nobody wants to talk to them anymore, which is why they don't have enough meetings. Yeah. Instead of engaging in content that's being put out on Twitter and LinkedIn, whereas if they say something meaningful in a comment in LinkedIn, they get asked to have a meeting versus the other way around. Yeah. Uh, and, and the way you, you talked about uh, Facebook being underpriced, and you talked about this white paper on LinkedIn. What is uh, kind of underpriced or right value, meaning to get uh, in contact with the right clients for business to business companies? The reason I love B2B is you know who you're trying to reach. And so when I said listening, I gave you the tactical way, which is people are putting out content and you can engage with that content and they'll see you. The much better way to listen is to know the company you're going after, doing some research for an hour or two or three days and understanding what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then things that people blow me away. For example, in my business, there's a lot of people I want to do business with, but if the CEO is best friends with Martin Sorrell, we're not getting that business. And so I'm stunned by salespeople's inability to deal in reality. I love when salespeople are like, I'm gonna break through. No, you aren't, asshole. (laughs) You're gonna waste time. And so I think listening, research, understanding, instead of blanket spray and pray, high volume, cold calls, emails, networking events, handing cards, it's just, it's not working. It's a waste of time and money. Sometimes the math works out. I'm not against it. I love the hustle. Um, But a lot more listening and understanding the score, understanding who you're competing with and understanding if that product, there's happiness in the system. The reason Boehner's grown so quickly is I paid attention to who was not happy with their digital work. I didn't go after, there's a lot of brands I wish I was working with. Cereal is my favorite product and we don't have a cereal client. I can't find the right angle right now to seeing any of the big cereal brands upset enough that it's a good conversation. Got it? Yeah. So a lot more, the best way to be a great salesperson is to be a listener, not a talker. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, all the way in the back. Get Think yourself over. a serial killer. What's that? Serial killer. Serial killer. <laughs> Somebody has a... Oh. It's hard yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey. Uh, my name's uh, Kurt and I'm the president of one of the universities here in, in Oslo. Very and nice. uh, university education is a dying industry. We're I slaves agree. to the campus model. Yep. Our government cares uh, only about getting people through fast enough. Correct. Uh, I assume you think education is a good idea, but of do you course. see any value for degrees? I do see value for degrees in the short and medium term if people have a very specific job they want and that organization requires a degree to get it. If you want to be a consultant at Bain and McKinsey in the next 24 to 36 months, I still believe that they care about where you went to college. However, and you can hold on to the mic because I think we might have a good conversation here. Great. I, uh, <laughs> however, to your question that you're leading, I think you're barking up the right tree. I don't think that people realize that the biggest and best universities in the world are only trading on brand, right? Not on the actual education. That that actual education is actually sitting at the professor level, not at the university or campus level. And as education gets commoditized, you know, distribution of education gets commoditized and things like Khan Academy and the seven other things that are about to happen. If you get the 13 best professors of economics together, if I, if I, as a great businessman, went out and rounded up the 13 best professors around economics and created a direct-to-consumer economics training education platform, we would dominate. We would dominate, we would win, because that's where the IP is. It's in her and him, not at the logo level. And so I think, you're, I think over the next 20 to 30 years, this great run of 100 years plus is coming to- thousand years. Respect, respect, because I'm undereducated. This great run, it's true, I'm, I am, I, I, to your point, is clearly in a vulnerable place. Um, and I think every country has its own dynamics. My answer was, you know, in America, you started getting into the 50s when everybody had to go to college or a community college, not go vocational, right? So there's different dynamics. Different cultures will spend their time differently in dissolving this but I think your energy is right. I think when somebody watches this video in 50 years, they're gonna say, wow, those guys got it. Those guys got it, yeah, because you know, uh, all we really need to do at the institutional level is 
in a sense, uh, double check and, and give accreditation to all the crazy online work experience combination of things that put pe that people put together to make an education. And don't the forget, I, and don't forget, that's just playing on the brand, right? That Putting that totally stamp approval is brand. just brand. But, and and assuring the quality. But the idea that we're going to draw everybody to move onto campus for five years to get an education, that's crazy. And listen, listen, the counter argument people say, well, people have grown up on these campuses, this and that, I go, I agree, but listen, travel around the world then. Tra you know, like there's so many alternatives to putting them on campus where they can learn to mature as individuals. You know, I mean, you're preaching to the choir on this one. Um, I, uh, I think it plays out, uh, but I, of course, learning is imperative. But like, you know, for me, you know, entrepreneurship's probably the one that is most intriguing to me because the thought of learning entrepreneurship in a classroom versus being in the field is just so ludicrous. And then America has a weird extra dynamic. The level of debt our citizens are going into. You've got 23 year olds coming out of college today with $280,000 in debt at enormously high interest rates and the piece of paper is not getting them a good job anymore. I mean, it's really bad in America, really bad. And ironically, it's the one thing you can't declare bankruptcy from and clear up. You can literally be fraudulent and clean up your credit, but you can't do it with a college debt. I mean, it's, it's such a fucking fraud, it makes me throw up. Yeah, that's right. Me too. Un yeah. Unfortunately, Gary, um, we're out of time for questions. Really? Yeah. Can um, we, can and we, the organizers are really strict about time. But can we sneak maybe one more in? Yeah, let's be rebels. Okay. Let's do that. Fuck that. Fight Last system. question. <laughs> okay, clearly okay, that guy. Okay, yeah. this guy, obviously. Yeah. Wow. That was, that was good marketing. Yeah, strong feelings. I'm telling you, sound is on voice, baby. Oh, sound. thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi, Gary Wee. I'm Jan Frederick B. Uh, <laughs> it's an honor to talk to you. Pleasure, um, my friend. You were, was, you were talking about Google and the possibility to do a deal as good as a steal. Then it was Facebook. Which emerging platforms do you see with the biggest potential for a steal deal right now? Alexa skills and briefings. Thank you. You're Ooh. welcome. <laughs> and let me give you guys why that, that plays out. I believe that if you're quick to building briefings and skills, and if you don't know the difference between an Alexa skill and Alexa briefing, you literally just Google it and in about 15 minutes you'll know. Got it? But one is just passive information, one is more AI and understands I can go back and forth with you. I, look, in the same way to your point, Snapchat's bigger here than Instagram, things of that nature, I always wanna give advice that matters to you. I don't know how the voice play plays out in the Nordics, but here's what I can tell you. It's going to happen, and the quicker you understand the theoretical strategies behind it, when your thing happens, you'll be able to move quicker instead of debating if it's gonna happen. And that's why I think that's the most, and I don't usually guess, or I don't, by day trading attention, you don't know what's coming next, you don't care, you only care about today. But to, to give you an insight, I do believe that is the clear black and white emerging space in our society. Nice. Amazing, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna give you some practical information on Norwegian, so bear with us. And Respect. then I'm gonna thank you and we're gonna give you a nice applause. Great. Um, okay. I'll check my phone. Yeah, do that. Uh, okay, alle sammen, jeg håper dere har koset dere masse. Jeg har litt praktisk informasjon helt på slutten av dagen. Vi har hatt en konkurranse gående. Uh, så uh, heldig vinner av, uh, av golftur med Golf Miklegård. Fire billetter. Paul Frile Grung kan komme bort hit etterpå og få billettene sine. Eller billettene sine. Og de som er glad i fotball, uh, Bayern München mot PSG. Vinneren er Kari Mette Toveru. Eh, så det er kult. Hun kan også komme bort dit. Eh, de som eh, ikke fikk goodie bags kan få det på veien ut. Eh, og middag eh, for de som har gullbillett er da på The Thief eh, nå rett etterpå. Det er solgt over 300 billetter til Oslo Business Forum 2018. Eh, så hvis dere har lyst til å hoppe på early burden dere, så må dere sikre dere billetter mens dere har muligheten. Nå har vi en kort liten aftermovie som viser bare highlightsene av dagen før vi da klapper for Gary. Så da forhåpentligvis kan vi snurre en film. Og så takker jeg etterpå. Jeg skal bare se movie, så to seconds. That's what I thought.
everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And let's give Gary a, a big applause. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Thank you. Leave your four cents, two points, two bullets from what you saw in the comments. And subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. So many of you being lazy. Anyway, nonetheless, leave your four cents, uh, two bullet points in the comments now.